Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem time-based key value store. And this is one of my favorite problems, honestly, on all of late code because there's not a lot of fancy tricks involved. You can really logically, uh, you know, dig your way through this problem. So you can go ahead and read through this description if you want, but I'm going to go ahead and jump straight into the explanation because I think this is best understood by actually going through an example. So our whole objective here is to design a key value store. So it's kind of like a hash map. We're going to have some key value and then we're going to have a value associated with that key. But we're actually not just going to have a single value. We're going to have a list of values. Uh, so plural. So it'll be a list. And in that list, we're going to have a pair of values. So it's not just going to be a single value. Each value is going to have a timestamp associated with it. So for an example, we can have a key value of, let's say, foo. And we would have a list of values associated with that. And one of the values, the pair of values, right? Because we're going to have a value and then a time. So the value, let's say, is going to be bar. It's a string in this case. And the timestamp associated with it, let's just say, in this case, the example, it's going to be integer. So let's just say it's one in this case. And then we could have a second value, right, associated with it as well. And that will have its own timestamp as well, right? So basically... It's going to be a list of values the and the values themselves are going to be pairs a value and then a timestamp associated with that so it's not super complicated but the main operations uh, that we're going to support are actually pretty simple just two operations uh, actually three if you count the constructor so yes we're going to have a you know a constructor because it's a, an object that we're designing a class uh, and the two operations we want to support on this uh, key value store are going to be set and get, which is pretty straightforward. That's what we would expect. So let's just go through this example. And I think the problem will actually make a lot of sense to you. So the first operation we have is a set operation. The key is going to be the first value, foo. The value is going to be bar. And the timestamp associated with it is going to be one. So let's uh, put the first value here. It's going to be bar. And the time associated with it is just one. And now we get the second operation, get. What are we getting? We're getting the key uh, associated with foo. And the, the second parameter in our get operation is actually going to be the timestamp. So when we do a get operation, normally on a hash map, we just need a key. But in this case, we need two values, the key and the timestamp, right? Because we know that for a single key, it's not enough to identify a value, right? Because there could be multiple values over here. We need the timestamp to identify the actual value. In this case, we were given a key value of foo and we were given a timestamp of one, right? You can see up above, yeah, it's one. And by the way, in case I didn't mention, we're actually going to be implementing this, this entire key value store with a hash map. So, uh, you know, the keys are just going to be normal uh, hash map keys. And the value in this hash map is going to be a list of values uh, with, you know, this schema, right? This, the list of values are going to be pairs. So when we use the key in the hash map, we're going to get a list of values, right? In this case, this list only has one pair of values. Bar is that value. And remember, we were given a timestamp of one. So in this list, we're going to basically iterate through the list to find the pair that has a timestamp of one. In this case, we did find it, right? It does exist. So then we can take this. And uh, the thing I think we're returning is just the value itself. So we can return bar. And you can see up above, that's what they ended up returning for this operation. So we did our first get operation. That's great. Now let's do our second get operation. In this case, we're given this pair. We're given the key is going to be foo. So right, we can go to the same list. And the timestamp is actually three in this case. But if you scan through the entire list that we have here, you can see that none of these have a timestamp of three associated with them. So what does that mean? Are we just going to return null in this case? No, because remember what we're doing here. We're designing a key, uh, a key value store based on time. So we set this value at time one. Now it's time three. So the way this problem wants us to handle the timing is basically if you don't find an exact match in our in our key value store, then just return the most recent one. So in this case, we're doing uh, the time is three, right? Just return the most recent one. And by recent, they mean the the closest value to three that's less than three. So for example, there's only a single value here, right? So in this case, we only have a single one and the time with that is one. So of course, one is going to be the closest 
to three, but what if instead we had something like four? Uh, four is close to three, but it's greater than three, so that's not allowed. We wanna find the closest uh, timestamp that's less than three. Now, if we had multiple, if we had another bar here or some other value and the time associated with that is two, then in that case, uh, which of these two would we want to uh, return? We would want to return this one, uh, even though the value is the exact same, but we'd want to return this one because it has a closer time to the three. But in this case, we only had a single value, so we're just gonna return bar again, and you can see in the explanation and the output that is the correct value, so we return bar in this case. Okay, so just cleaning up what we've already done so far, but now we're at a second set operation. The values associated with this set are, well, the key is foo, so same you know slot we're gonna go over here, and the value in this case is bar two, pretty simple, and the time associated with it is four. So that's the timestamp, uh, bar two, and the time is four. And by the way, the set operation that we're doing is always going to be a constant time operation, big O of one, right? Because the, you know, finding the key is an O of one operation because we're using a hash map. And then, uh, you know, this list of values is going to be a list. And every time we add a value to this list, we're always going to add it to the end of the list. So we can do that in big O of one time. So not too bad, but where things get tricky, uh, now that we're done with the second set operation, where things get tricky is when we get to the get operation. So now we're at another get operation. The key is foo and the timestamp is four. So we're gonna go to the same slot here. And then and now that we actually have more values, you're probably getting at what the bottleneck is. So in this case, the timestamp is four. So we wanna look in this list, we wanna look for an exact match. And if we can't find an exact match, we wanna find the closest value that's less than four. And how exactly are we gonna be doing that? If we just do a linear scan through the array, worst case, it's gonna be linear time. Now that's really not that bad, but the question is, can we do any better? Well, obviously, very few algorithms are better than big O of n. One of the algorithms that's better than big O of n is binary search, which we know runs in log n time. That's definitely an improvement over big O of n, but that would require that our values are sorted. But what exactly do these values have to be sorted by? Do they have to be sorted by the value or by the timestamp? Well, since we're searching for an exact match with the timestamp, these have to be sorted by the timestamp. So again, not too bad bad. What are we supposed to do though? Are we supposed to sort this every single time we want to do a get operation? That's not going to make things any better because if we have to sort, the time complexity is not going to be log n and it's not even going to be n either. It's going to be n log n. So that's not an improvement at all. And so this is the part where we kind of have to be smart. Let's go down and read the problem carefully. If you scroll all the way down and read the fine print, you can see that all the timestamps, every time we, we set a value, the timestamp is going to be in increasing order, strictly in increasing order. So how does this help us? Well, basically it means if we have a list here and every time we set a value, we just add it to the end of the list, then the list is actually gonna be sorted by the timestamp by default. So it's already in sorted order. So that's why uh, we don't have to sort it again. We actually can just run a binary search. That's really good for us. But what if you, you know, what if you didn't really read the fine print? Well, th the way this problem is set up, I think it's kind of intuitive that if you are in a real interview, the best question would be to ask, every time we set a value, is it, you know, is the timestamp gonna be in ascending order? Because, you know, the way a set operation would work in real life is you would use the the current time that, you know, the current time that you're setting the value. And, you know, as most of us know, time really just flows in one direction. So it makes sense that these, uh, you know, the list that we're setting would already be in sorted order. But again, that's kind of why I like this question, because even if you don't read the fine print, you might think to yourself, are the set operations going to be in sorted order? And that would be a really good question to ask in a real interview. So in this case, we would want to run binary search, which would be log n time. So that just means that the get operation, worst case, is going to be a log n operation. And by the way, if we're looking for the key value four, we know that it exists. So this is what we would end up returning. We would return bar two. And you can see that's exactly what they did return in 
the output. So we're done with another operation. Let's cross this out and let's do our last operation, the get operation. In this case, the key is foo. So again, over here and the timestamp is five. So again, we're gonna run binary search, right? We're looking for an exact match of five. And if we can't find the five, what's the closest thing that we can get that's less than five? Well, in this case, it's four. So the value of that is bar two. So again, we'd return bar two. So that's kind of the, what I wanted to cover with this problem. Of course, we just had a single key, but you know, this problem wouldn't be much different if we had a second key or, you know, multiple keys. So I think we can actually go into the code now and see how we can implement this binary search solution. Okay, so now let's get into the code. And so you can see that they already gave us like a class and a few uh, functions that we're gonna define. So uh, the only thing we really need to do in the constructor is just initialize our store. Like I mentioned, it's just gonna be a pretty simple hash map uh, where the key value is gonna end up being a string and the value of the hash map is gonna be a list of lists. So a list of pairs really, but what we're actually gonna be using to implement that pair is gonna be, yes, a uh, another sublist. And the values of that sublist are gonna represent the value itself, which is gonna be a string. And the second is gonna be the timestamp. Uh, and yeah, just to kind of condense this, uh, basically we're gonna have a key. That key is gonna be mapped to a list of pairs. Okay, so now let's get into the set operation because it's a little bit more simple than the get operation. The way I'm gonna do this is first just check. So of course we're inserting something based on this key value, based on this key, and based on this value, based on this timestamp. So this is gonna be that pair of value timestamp and this is just gonna be the key of the hash map. First of all, we wanna know, does this key even exist in our store? And if it doesn't exist in our store, first thing we wanna do is just you know insert it into the store and you know set it to, let's say, an empty list. So put this key and just set it to an empty list. Uh, you probably don't need to do this line. We could just use a default dictionary if we really wanted to, but I don't wanna abuse Python too much because I think sometimes it makes things too easy. And this would kind of be, I assume this is what you would wanna do if you were doing this in Java or C++ or something like that. Yeah, so after we have, uh, you know, ha we know that for sure we have an empty list there, then all we wanna do is to that list, append a value to it, right? Append to the end of the list, uh, a pair of values, the value itself and the timestamp associated with it. And that's really it, right? The set operation is pretty straightforward in this case, but the get operation is where things are gonna get a little bit tricky. So first I'm just gonna initialize the result. Initially, it's just gonna be an empty string. And the reason I'm doing this is because if this key doesn't even exist in the store itself, then this is what they want us to return. They just want us to return an empty string. That's why I'm initializing it this way. And the next thing we wanna do is actually check what that list of values actually is. So let's go to our store and run the get operation. The reason I'm using the get is because if we find a match, it'll return that list. If it doesn't find a match with this key, by default, we can uh, tell it to just return an empty list. Yeah, so this is our list of values. And now is when we actually wanna run the binary search. And then after we run the binary search, we're gonna end up returning whatever the result happens to be. As you may know, uh, binary search has usually two pointers, a left and right pointer. I have solved a variety of binary search problems on this channel. I even have a binary search playlist if you uh, wanna practice. Uh, but yeah, so let's set the left and let's get the length of the array minus one is gonna be our right pointer. And basically while the left pointer hasn't crossed the right pointer, we are gonna run the binary search. Uh, actually it should be equal if we wanna make sure to get the last value, but yeah, so we have a left and right pointer and usually we wanna look at the middle value. So we can just take left plus right, divide it by two. In, uh, in Python, integer division, uh, you need two uh, slashes to do that. Otherwise it does decimal division. And uh, then we just wanna know, did we find the result or not? Well, if we found it, let's check in our values, values at index M. And we know this is gonna be a pair of values. We wanna look at the timestamp, which is the second value up above, right? You can see even in the comments, we sh said that the second value is the timestamp. So we can go to index one. If this is equal to the timestamp that we're searching for, which was an input parameter to this function called timestamp, Actually, instead of an exact match, let's first check if it's less than the timestamp. 
uh, less than or even equal to the timestamp because in that case, we know that it's a valid value because remember the else case from this is completely different than this one, right? If it's equal to the timestamp or less than the timestamp, that's completely fine. But if it's greater than the timestamp, that value is not allowed. So we are gonna be handling these two cases a little bit differently. So with most binary search, if we, uh, if we know that this is less than the timestamp, what would we wanna do? We would wanna say, and the way we'd wanna update the pointer is to set left equal to mid plus one because we wanna search to the right portion if it was less than the result. But before we uh, do that even, we want to say the result so far at this point, right? Since this is a valid value and this is the closest value we have seen so far, we are gonna set the result equal to values, uh, you know, basically the value at index M. Uh, and then, you know, this is gonna be index zero, right? Because this is the closest we have seen so far. That's how this binary search is gonna work. This is the closest we've seen so far. Now let's go to the next iteration of the loop and then see if we got any closer to the result. But the else case is gonna be, uh, whoops, the else case is gonna be the opposite. Here, all we're gonna do is update the pointer. If the value uh, was too big, it was greater than the timestamp, which is what the else case is. We would wanna update the right pointer, set it to mid minus one, and then then you know, that, that's just how we're gonna be searching. But we're not gonna assign the result here because this is an invalid value. We cannot assign it to the result. Technically, this isn't as optimized as it could be because you know, in this uh, equals, in the first case, if we even find the exact match to the timestamp, we're not even returning, right? We're still continuing the binary search, which is kind of suboptimal, but it doesn't change the overall time complexity. It's still log n. And in this case, I kind of prefer the concise code. So I'm gonna leave it as it is because we are actually done with the function. After you know this binary search is over, we're gonna go ahead and return the result, whether it's an empty string or whether we actually found the correct value, uh, you know, the closest value to that timestamp. That's the entire code. Let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see on the left, yes, it does work and it's pretty efficient. Probably could be a little bit more efficient if we actually returned when we find the value, but that's okay. I hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It really supports the channel a lot. Consider checking out my Patreon where you can further support the channel and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.